Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. Welcome all who are gathered with us here in the sanctuary. Welcome to those who are gathering uh, from your home worship spaces. Uh, welcome this Labor Day weekend uh, into this space. So sometimes at this time in the morning, the sun is shining in, but today it's a little overcast. But when it's cloudy, we are reminded that God is in the clouds. You know, in the Old Testament, we're reminded of this, that that God moves in a pillar of cloud. So we are overshadowed, literally overshadowed in the grace of God this morning as we gather for worship. Um, you have been uh, listening. Your hearts have been um, lifted, hopefully, to the music that Doug Stewart's been playing this morning. Welcome to Doug, who is joining us as our guest accompanist and worship leader this morning. Thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you and to be blessed by your music. If you are... Uh, one from home who likes to join us in the lighting of the Christ candle, I invite you to find that candle now and the lighter and join us as we join our hearts in prayer. Jesus of Christ, you are light of the world. And we pray in this moment, in this somewhat overcast day, we pray for your light still to shine to shine in our hearts, to shine in our worshiping space, shine in our churches, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our world, shine in every darkened corner of our hearts. Let your light of healing and warmth and love so shine, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. In a time when peace feels impossible, we come to hear God's promise of peace. In lives that are filled with conflict and fear, experience the peace that's of understanding. In communities where violence and hate seem to reign, we come to make peace. Our opening song is hymn number 466, Come and Fill Our Hearts. It is from the Taizé community in France, and these songs from this community are intended to be melodic, harmonic. They're intended to be sung over and over. They're fairly simple, and so you just allow yourselves to kind of get lost in the song, in the music, allow it to just kind of fill your hearts, literally, with God's peace. And so we're going to listen to this one played through first one time by Doug, and then we're going to start to sing it. And we're going to sing it over and over again. 
the indication that you will have, that I will have, that we will have, that we have come to the end of singing this is when Doug stops playing and we just sing it a cappella that last time through. Okay, so come and fill our hearts with your peace. Go ahead, let's stand together. 466, stand as you're able, please. It is at this time in our worship in our worship service that we share, we are invited to share with each other the joys and concerns on our hearts, those things that rest heavily, that uh, weigh us down, those concerns that we have that we are seeking to share with one another and ask for prayers, those things that are light on our hearts that we want to share because we're joyful and we want to share that joy with each other. And so, um, uh, it, uh, okay, we are... We are handing a microphone to Reed this morning. And Reed, um, will, when you raise your hand and you have a joy or concern to share, Reed will make his way over to you. And I do invite you to speak right into the microphone, say your name so we know who you are, and then also what you are seeking to share. And then uh, we'll, just, we'll just conclude each sharing with the Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayers. I'm Carol Lou Weaver and uh... You know, in this church, we have a lot of joy when we do a mission project. They just finished the migrant project, which was wonderful this year. And I'm looking forward to Christmas. Uh, we have uh, at this church done a tremendous job with providing assistance at Christmas time. It's not too early to start planning ahead. One of the things that we did last year was we included in each of the baskets gifts of uh, their tags for Christmas gifts that are made out of old Christmas cards. And in order to continue this, we need old Christmas cards. So if any of you have old Christmas cards stashed away and would like to donate them to be recycled, there is no personal information that is passed on. That's all cut off and disposed of. And so if you have any that you'd like to share to help us with this joy, we'd be very grateful. Thank, Thank you, you. Carol Lou. Thank you. I was talking about the adoptive family baskets that we put together uh, or gift ba bags that we put together and putting a card in. Thank you, Carol Lou. So save your old Christmas cards and give them over to Carol Lou. Good morning. My name is Lisa Michelin and I ask for your prayers. Um, I'm going to try and get through this. My daughter has a friend who is 10 and is, um, has been diagnosed with a brain tumor. They are working right now to diagnose exactly, they don't know yet whether it's brain cancer or bone cancer. Um, so prayers, please, for Van. Thank you. Say his name again, please. Van. Van. 
Lord, we lift Van to you and his family and his friends at this tender time and this time when there's uncertainty about what the diagnosis actually is. And he's so little. A future spans before him that we seek and pray and yearn that he will be able to live into. And so we lift Van to you for your grace and your healing, O oh God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hi, I'm Meg Miller, and um, on behalf of the Hospitality Committee, we have a couple things to sign up for next weekend. One is our, thank you, you want to hold it, Lisa? You just put it right over your face. Uh, <laughs> the Sunday School kickoff and our musical director, choir directors will be here next week, and we're going to do a dessert potluck, so sign up to bring a dessert, set up and clean up is needed. Also, this coming Friday at Pam and, Dar Pam and Scott Adair's house outside, Big TV is movie night, and the movie is Invict Invictus. You, um, and we are providing the hospitality popcorn, popcorn and candy. You bring your own food, uh, drink, and you bring a chair, and we'll watch the movie at six thirty this Friday night. This sign up will be in the lobby as you leave, so please sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Other joys and concerns to share this morning. She might be able to speak right into that mic, Reed. Hi, I'm Kate Winter, and I just want to ask for traveling mercies for Joel and me. We are traveling to Maine starting, well, we're going to the airport Tuesday night, and then we're flying out Wednesday morning. And <clears throat> I haven't flown in 10 years, and I have no idea how many years it's been since Joel's flown. So just travel mercies and beautiful weather and time with friends in Maine. Thank you. Gracious God, we lift to you, Kathy, Kate, and Joel, as they get ready to travel to Maine. And we know that uh, they have some anxieties about this. And so we pray that you would fill their hearts with peace and trust that all will be well as they come together to reunite with friends they haven't seen in so long. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hello, I'm Louise Solomon. I'm a reading for Marilyn Vikina. Our family is in full of praise to God for the faith and love our Aunt Reba has showered on us all through the beautiful life of 101 years. We also praise God for the beautiful time we shared with our sons and family during Miguel's birthday and anniversary. We lift up to you, uh, your, your dear beloved Reba and the family that has been nurtured and cared by her for all of the days of her life. And uh, we ask for your comfort, your blessing, your peace to be upon them. And we also give you thanks for the celebration of Miguel's uh, birthday with family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anybody else? I'm Donna Andre. Um, so a joy. I don't know about you, but I think the growth that we have got to participate with in our rain garden is incredible. Like, I don't know how that all happened in one season from a lawn, like to like blooms and growth and joy. And I think, you know, praise God for that. And praise for the people who help make that happen, who led the charge to create that. Ta-da, over there. Thank you very much. And piggybacking on that, there is this growth of a youth program, of Sunday school, of the rainbow room and the grotto. And yeah, wait, do that again. Stand up, please. Come here. Do you see this? Boom. <laughs> yeah, I get him this year. I get him in the grotto. We got rainbow room people. We've got Sam, who is working so wonderfully. And... I just hope and I look forward to everyone supporting that if you know young people and can have them here. I mean, we just hang out in the grotto if you're, how old are you? 11 to 14-ish. And, and, the, and the curriculum is wonderful. 
Sam in the Rainbow, Rainbow Room, a same thing. And we just like look for anybody who can hang with us. Like I just need, I would love to have an adult. Many of you have sat down in the, in the grotto with me around the table with these people and hung out and joined in their conversation. And that's been, that's all, that's all you need to do. So if I reach out to you and say, hey, can you play with us in the grotto? Come and hang out with us. Just come down and hang out. Sam is looking for people to build in the rainbow room. So if we're reaching out, it's because we got another garden to plant. And it's just the same beauty. For the beauty of the earth. Thank you, God. Thank Amen. you, Donna. And um, next Sunday, next Sunday, we're kicking off our Sunday school program and we will have the grow pole back in here. So those of you who have a little mark from last year, we get to see exactly how much you've grown from last year to this year. And I know that we're excited to see that because I can just tell by looking at you, you're sprouting up there like those plants in the garden. Anybody else have a joy or concern to share? Uh, anyone else? Oh, over here? Over here? I just want to follow up with what Donna said. Um, next week is our kickoff party, and I encourage all of you to bring a yard game to play with us in the side yard following church um, and just to mingle and enjoy fellowship with us after services. How many of you have a cornhole set at home? Bring it. Bring it. We're going to try to do a cornhole uh, tourney on the lawn next Sunday after church as we're also eating our desserts. Um, bocce, croquet, bring your lawn games to share and have some fun. I'm Kristen Schick. Um, this is coming from a grandma. <laughs> I've got four grandsons that are playing football from Michigan State down to a seven-year-old, and I don't even know what you call the football they play. It's non-con, you know, it's not tackle football. But anyway, think of all the kids that are in sports, fall sports, and let's uh, just pray to keep them safe and healthy. Um, I'm sure all of, you know, a lot of you have grand daughters and grandsons or daughters and sons that are in sports. So let's keep them in our thoughts too. Thank you. God, we lift to you all of our young people that are starting out into the sports season and will be competing on the field of play. We pray for your safety uh, to be to surround them and for health and wholeness, uh, not just physically, but also emotionally and mentally as they come together to play. We pray for that, um, that well-being on the teams um, in, in, in their collegiality as well as their play. We pray, Lord, in your mercy hear our prayers. Anybody else? Hi, my name is Chris Tracy. I am asking for prayers for somebody in the community. I don't know them very personally, but it's a lot of communities that intertwine. Then her name is Jessa. They have a GoFundMe that I will share. Um, she found out that she she's around my age and she has stage four colorectal cancer and her 13 year old, they just found a mass on her spine after her 13 year old went paralyzed from the waist down. So they could really use our prayers. I'll also find out how we can help the community in other ways too. And then I'll have like more of a game plan of what to do. Um, but if you could at least pray for them, I'm sure somebody in the community knows of them because there are so many different ways that they cross. Um, but I will, like I said, I will share. So Jessa, I don't remember what her daughter's name is, but her daughter's 13. And then her husband is Sam. So Thank Sam and you. Jessa. Thank you, Chris. For Jessa, for Jessa's family, and for this community, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, I have a joy this morning. Is there some, is there another? A one, okay. I'm going to hold my joy. I'm Gary Roberts. I, uh, my nephew has just lost his daughter with a drug overdose. Oh, Gary. So, keep, uh, Joseph Hergel is in your prayers. What is her name? Joseph Hergel is in. Joseph? Joseph was the son that, or is that your nephew? For Joseph and his family as they grieve the loss of their child. Uh, oh God, there are no words, but we pray for your healing grace. Uh, we pray for strength. And we pray for your deep and abiding presence. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayers. Anybody else? Okay, I have a joy to share this morning. It is the celebration of baptism. We are going to be celebrating the baptism of Audrey. Audrey, the name means noble strength. So this little one, um, we are going to pray that she grows into that name. Noble strength, Audrey. Audrey Lynn Nangle. Audrey is the daughter of Brandy Null and Corey Nangle. Brandy, you'll see these people in just a moment, but Brandy is a member of this church. She is the granddaughter of Sharon Coffey. Sharon is the sister of Bill Warren. So I hope you were taking notes and you got the family tree. But Bill and Bev are going to bring forward the water for this baptism. And so I invite you, Bill and Bev, to bring forward the water. And I invite the Holy Family to join me at the bowl, please. And I was also um, wondering if we have any children that are here, they're not able to see from a front row seat. And it looks like you're all right here already. Excellent. And Bill, you can just pour that right into the bowl. Thank you. And I would just ask you to hold on to that for me, please, or put that back in the back. Thank you so much, you guys. What a big day. What a big day for all of you. What a big day for all of us. Hear these words with me from Matthew 28. This is from the message translation. God authorized and commanded me to commission you, said our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in the way of life, marking them for baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you I will be with you as you do this, Jesus said, day after day, after day, after day, after day, right up to the end of the age. Obeying Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us, showing that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death and unites us in the life and mission in the death and resurrection, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to his ministry of love, peace, and justice. So today, in this moment, let us remember our own baptisms, even as we celebrate Audrey's. If you were baptized when you were Audrey's age, you don't get to remember this cognitively, but we are remembering as we watch and we hear the promises made that these same promises were made for you one day so long ago. On behalf of the session of the First Presbyterian Church of Tecumseh, I present Audrey Lynn, daughter of Randy Null and Corey Nengel, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Randy and Corey, oh, she's so excited. Do you desire that Audrey be baptized? If so, please say we do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and teach that faith to Audrey? If so, please say we do. And do you all, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Audrey by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ? If so, please say together, do. do. Brandy and Corey, trusting in God's grace and mercy. Do you turn from evil and renounce its power on the world? And if so, please say, we do. Do you turn toward Jesus, trusting him to lead you in the way of love and truth and life? If so, please say, we do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, we will with God's help. <laughs> All right, please join me in prayer. Come to this water. Water is the primary symbol of baptism. And so we give thanks to God for the gift of water. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of water and all of the principles held within it. Water that was at the creation parted when you brought forth life in the garden. 
water that was moved when you freed uh, your children from slavery in Egypt, water that's been used, placed on people's eyes to bring them sight, water that we bathe in, water that gives us, that came forth from a rock in the wilderness to give life to those who were thirsty. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would move through this water even now as we prepare to use it in the baptism, in the sacrament of baptism for our sister, Audrey, that you by your spirit would move through this water and, and give as an outward sign the inward seal of your grace upon her life. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. All right. Hi, sweetie. Hi, sweetie. Oh, hey, sweetie. Hello, you big girl. Audrey Lynn, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son <clears throat> and of the Holy Spirit. And I mark you with the sign of the cross that you will be Christ's faithful disciple throughout the days of your life. Audrey, I mark a blessing upon your life. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> that God may bless you with the Holy Spirit, may bless you with a spirit of wisdom and understanding, <laughs> may bless you with a spirit of counsel and might, may bless you with a spirit of knowledge and love of the Lord God, and may bless you in the joy of the presence of God in your life. We pray this upon you, sweet Audrey, as we welcome you into the family of Christ. Amen. She's a little wiggle work. But I want to introduce you to your newest sister in Christ. This is Audrey Lynn. And I want you, Audrey, to look at their smiling faces as they place their sweet, beautiful eyes upon you. And they welcome you with their hearts and with their love. Beautiful. And the children, I have a little bit of a message for you this morning before Sam takes you back to the back. I just want to ask you, first of all, do you know what the peace sign looks like? Do you know what a peace sign looks like? What does it look like? Okay, maybe make it with your bodies. Can you guys make a peace sign with your bodies? You don't know? You don't know? Do you know how to make a peace sign, anyone? Know how to make one? This is a peace sign, but I'm talking about that big circle. Yes, make it with your body. There you go, do it, do it. Do what you just did. And then, down like this, peace. All right, well, I wanted to ask you guys this question. Um, I thought that the peace sign, that we were just doing that circle with a line down the center and then two lines off to the side, I thought the peace sign was something that always existed. But I'm not, I wasn't right about that. It was not, it was not, it didn't exist before 1958. How old were you in 1958? <laughs> How many of you were alive in 1958? And did you know that that's when the peace sign came onto the, onto the scene, the peace sign in 1958? And you might know the story of the peace sign, but I just wanna show you guys just because I think it's kind of cool. I have in my hands these flags. This is what was used by the designer whose name was Jerry. He was a guy from, he was a British man. And he used the, um, the letters, that are part of an alphabet called semaphore. Raise your hand back out here if you know semaphore. Anybody know semaphore? Oh, there's a couple, right? There's a couple and semaphore is still used in the Navy today. It is like Morse code, it's a code language, but you do it with flags. And so where you hold your hands, how you hold your hands and arms is what the letter is. And Sam has the whole alphabet. She's gonna teach you how to communicate with each other with semaphore, but what does it have to do with the peace sign? 
Well, Jerry, the guy from Great Britain, who was thinking about how do I communicate peace, he decided he was going to use the sign for N, which is this. This is N. And then D, which is this. Right? So the peace sign has this big line that goes right through the center. D and N. And then the circle for the world. So why are those the letters that he chose in 1958? What was going on in 1958, you guys? Okay. What? Oh, there was war going on. Well, yeah. Vietnam. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. N stood for nuclear, which I don't even know if you guys know what nuclear is. What do you? Nuclear disarmament. Now that's a big, big word, but really this is what it means. No bombs. No bombs. So Jerry, Jerry drew this circle with a N and a D. And some people laughed at him and said, well, that will never fly. But guess what? We still talk about it today. And I, at my farm, have a big peace sign mowed in my back field that's 400 feet in diameter of the D and the N, but it's really peace for the world. Is that not cool? Don't you want to learn how to communicate with each other, how to spell out our your name, your name, your name with these flags to each other? I know you do. I'm going to give these to you. We're going to pray, and you're going to go back with Sam, and she's going to teach you how to do it. But aren't we thankful for Jerry? and the symbol that he showed us. Let's pray. God, we pray that we would be not only thankful for the symbol of peace, but that we would embody peace in our lives, we pray. Amen. Have fun. Okay. Turn now to our call to confession. This is inspired by Psalm 46. So I'm going to introduce to you a meditative practice uh, that is, um, you could do this with, uh, you know, any line of a prayer that you'd like to do, but this happens to be a line out of scripture. And so what we do with this is we go very slowly. This is going to be our call to confession this morning. We go very slowly one word, two words, a little bit more of the phrase, a little bit more of the phrase, the whole phrase, and then we back it back down again as we settle ourselves. And so when we do this, you can do this wherever you are. You can do this at work. You can do this at school. You can do this at home. You can do this before you go into a tense family meeting. You can do this wherever, this calming. And I'm just going to invite you to say these words with me. Just follow my lead. B. Be still. Be still. Be still and know. Be still. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Be still and know that I am. Be still. Be still and know. Be still. Be. This morning's prayer of confession and assurance of God's grace is written by Avery Arden. Avery is a Louisville Theological Seminary graduate from the class of 2019. Avery is also autistic, queer, white, and married. Avery writes and shares worship liturgy that is affirming, challenging, inclusive and expansive on a website called Binary Breaking Worship. Loving God as one, we confess our failings. We aim to seek justice. But then, when truth is honored, 
do it with us and we rush to see you grace. We aim to embrace kindness, but then snap the bottom of the stranger, remain ignorant of what is We aim to walk humbly with you, our God. But what we ignore how we affect the nation. We cry peace when we need compliance. We cry peace when we need complacency. We cry peace when there is no peace. Forgive us, we pray. Friends, there is a kindness in God's justice that hears out our confessions and liberates us to move forward to build a new and better world. God's word forgives and redeems us. God's breath revitalizes us for the journey. Emboldened by this good news, let us share God's love with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to turn to your neighbor down the pew, across the room, and offer the peace of Christ to each other. <laughs> Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah writes during a time of chaos and political unrest. I'm not sure there's ever not been a time of chaos and political unrest, at least somewhere in the country and the world. He speaks in hope of a future leader, one upon whom God's spirit will rest. You will hear Kate echo the words I prayed for Audrey earlier. Words of blessing and strength and faithfulness and wisdom. These are marks of one who walks in God's way. It is a prayer we offer for all of our children. So then Isaiah leads, lays out a vision for peace. And I invite you to listen as Kate describes the pairs of animals who coexist, sharing shelter and food and play. And this is a vision of God's kingdom and an end to destruction, violence, and oppression. And as we listen, I, I would invite us to imagine how these words from the prophet Isaiah have been heard throughout the centuries by communities all across the globe in whatever circumstances surround them. They hear this as a dream, a vision of peace, a balm for the soul. The uh, Old Testament scripture is from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the, for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard li shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
The second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. This story takes place on the Sea of Galilee. And I will invite you to speak the words of Jesus this morning. They're bold for you, bold yellow. And I also invited Doug, and he agreed <laughs> to give us some musical interpretation to help us relate to the mood changes in this story. The gospel reading is Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we made a promise. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Audrey by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ? Did you hear those active words? Guide, nurture, encourage to do what? To know and follow Christ. Christ. We are called, and in fact, this is our primary vocation, regardless of whatever occupation we have, we are called to follow Christ and to guide and nurture and encourage others to follow Christ as well. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. In the earliest days, the Romans called them Christianos, which means little Christs. And they called each other followers of the way. Followers of the way of life they learned from Jesus. Following Jesus is more than an intellectual belief. It's more than saying creeds or saying liturgy. It's more than singing the words of hymns. It's more than giving to worthy and faithful causes. It is all of those things. And most importantly, it is walking the walk. It is actually thinking and doing, reading and acting, giving and engaging. One of my favorite quotes from Barbara Brown Taylor is this. The whole purpose of the Bible, it seems to me, she wrote, is to convince people to set the written word down in order to become living words in the world for God's sake. That's what I think following Jesus is, becoming living words in the world for God's sake. This way of Jesus is not uh, intuitive. It's countercultural. And to do it, it takes practice and practice and practice, not to get it perfect, but to make it our habit, our way of life. You know, if you want to be good at golf, you go to the driving range and the putting green. If you want your body to heal well after surgery, you do the exercises your physical therapist gives you to do. If you want to be an accomplished musician, you spend hours learning and playing your instrument. If you want to be fluent in a foreign language, you listen and you speak it over and over and over again. It's no different with the life of faith. 
It takes learning and trying and trying and trying again and again and again. So each month, starting today, we're going to introduce a new practice of this way of following Jesus. And for four weeks in that month, we'll look at that practice with a different perspective. And we'll give ideas and suggestions, just like your physical therapist gives exercises, we'll give exercises to try during the coming week until we come together again on Sunday or even longer if you like trying these exercises, right? And then we're going to give an opportunity for people to come together on Thursdays, like a stated opportunity, 7 a.m. on Zoom if you're an early riser or noon if you want to come to the church to check in with each other. How are you doing? Because I don't know about you, but when I'm working on something new, accountability is really helpful for me to share how it's going. And so the prayer is, the hope is that we will grow as individuals in our walk with Jesus, that we'll grow as a family of faith, and that actually we will reach out beyond our, our walls, the walls of this church, to live this faith and change the world in Jesus' name. So today we begin our practice, make peace. Make peace peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called children of God. Peace is an essential attribute of the kingdom of God throughout the whole Old Testament. It's shalom in Hebrew. Shalom, it means not just absence of war or conflict. It means wholeness. It means health, prosperity, security, friendship, Salvation, shalom is this all-encompassing wellness. All is and all are well in shalom. Middle Eastern scholar Kenneth Bailey says it this way, peace in the Bible includes the finest of loving relationships between individuals within families, communities, and nations. Shalom. In God's dream, spoken by the prophet Isaiah, wolves lie down with lambs and leopards with young goats and babies, babies play near poisonous snakes. That is not the world that we live in. I remember being traumatized as a child when my father took a big shovel and knocked down the big black spider that I had taken to calling Charlotte on the bush in our front yard. I would sit and talk to her. And then she was smashed in front of me and I cried and cried. She was my friend, daddy. She was my friend. But he was afraid because, you know, sometimes in this world, spiders are poisonous and snakes can hurt and wound children. And wolves eat lambs and leopards eat young goats. But here's this dream, this vision of Isaiah. In God's kingdom, the relationship between predators and prey is redefined and trust is restored and there is no fear and all is well. And this is what shalom looks like. They will not hurt. They will not destroy on God's holy mountain. So I invite us to think about this dream, not necessarily in terms of those animals, but in terms of kingdoms and power and poverty and oppression and political chaos, and unholy alliances, and greed, and violence, and predatory human behavior. Isaiah wrote in the 8th century, in a time of political chaos and unrest, the Assyrian Empire was on the rise. They were conquering more and more lands. They were taking people into captivity, ripping them from their homes, sending them into exile. And he wrote these words. Judah's kings, the southern kingdom of Jerusalem, of, of, um, of Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah, Judah's kings were um, compromising their ethics. They were afraid and they were acting out of that fear. Uh, they were trading integrity for short-term security. And Isaiah talked about a different kind of leader, a God-ordained leader who would lead people courageously into shalom, who would be a true maker of peace. The Greek word, erene, comes from the verb airo, meaning to join together into a whole. When the New Testament writers write about erene, peace, they're thinking about shalom, this wholeness, making the world, people, relationships complete. 
So Jesus called blessed, the ones who bring about wellness and wholeness, the ones who make, produce, activate peace. They are the children of God, he said. In Mark's story, Jesus calls for silence and stillness in the face of the storm. Quiet. Literally, the raging seas are muzzled. Peacemakers following Jesus bring calm into chaos. Our news, are, our news is filled with stories of violence and wars around the world. It's overwhelming. You and I both know that it is. Our team convened last week on Zoom to talk about what we had seen and heard in Israel and Palestine just earlier this summer and what, how we would respond. How do we respond to those stories? Do we have a courageous conversation? Yes, we do. On October 7th, we're having one of the friends we met in Israel here at our church to talk about making peace in that part of the world. It's seven o'clock. You'll hear more about it. Do we, do we show pictures in our slideshows for worship? George, yes, we do. In uh, the last several weeks of worship, there've been pictures from our time over there as well. Do we give financially to peacemakers who are engaged in different parts of the world? Yes, we do. Today, we're introducing the Peace and Global Witness offering from the PCUSA that does just that. Our financial gifts support the work of peacemakers. And, and one of our team members, Adam, who lives in North Carolina in the Outer Banks, he teaches surf to kids. And Adam on this call said, you know how I'm responding? I'm choosing to teach the kids kindness. I'm choosing to be kind myself to be patient with them. I'm choosing to teach them patience with each other, gentleness with each other. I'm choosing to teach them a different way. And that is the way peacemaking starts, isn't it? We start wherever we are, in every relationship, in every conversation, in every social media post. We have the opportunity to bring even greater wholeness by our words by our very presence, sometimes by our stillness, by our body language, to show another way, the way of Jesus. So I invite you to think about the areas of conflict in your life. And what can you do to make peace? What small step can you make toward calming the storm? Remember, biblical peacemaking is more than avoiding. It's more than accommodating. It's more than complacency. Biblical peacemaking is actively pursuing wholeness. Biblical peacemaking is reducing fear. It's creating common ground. It's speaking truth with courage and compassion. So I want to offer a list of options of practices of exercises. I'm going to give five exercises that I would invite you to do. I would invite all of us to do any number of these, all of these, whatever, in the coming week. The first one, look around you for images of peace. Look around you for ways, evidences that you see that God is indeed at work in the world bringing peace. Look for images of peace and then amplify those images. So when they show up on your social media, amplify those images of peace, those words of peace. Share that peace that you see. And maybe at the end of the night, reflect on those images you saw in a journal, maybe that you might keep. Number two, add quiet into each day. Maybe it's five minutes. Maybe it's 10 minutes. Maybe it's multiple five minutes. Find a place, carve out a space in your house where you work, uh, maybe in a garden somewhere that that's going to be your space that you go to as a discipline. Carve out quiet in your life. Put your phones down, walk away, go into that stillness and remember to be still and know that God is God. Number three, challenge yourself to act and speak with the intention of building shalom, building wellness with coworkers or family members or friends, especially 
those relationships that are strained, reach out and try being peaceful. Four, look for inspiration from contemporary peacemakers. If you go on and Google today's peacemakers, you'll see all kinds of stories of people who are doing this in our country, around the world, and you can read and be inspired by what they're doing as well, the people that you'll meet online, today's peacemakers. And the final one is, Isaiah says, a little child shall lead them. And we think Jesus, maybe when we hear that, and that's certainly the way that the earliest Christian communities interpreted that text, that that was Jesus. And also, we are invited to learn peacemaking from the ways of our children and the ways of the children in the world. And so be mindful. See the ways that children teach us about peacemaking. And maybe journal a little bit about what you see. And then every week on Thursdays, I'm going to offer an opportunity to check in and share with each other. 7 a.m., you'll see the Zoom link if you're up that early. Noon, if you're not up that early and you want to check in. You don't have to come to one of those places. Check in with each other, but, but, but let's practice. Let's practice together. I'm thinking about our peace walk out on the farm. There's a 400-foot diameter path that Andy mowed. And right in the center of it, right in the center of it is a peace pole. And it's got four different languages. May peace prevail on earth in Arabic, in Spanish, in Indonesian, and English. At least that's what it was intended to say in those languages. But it turns out, even though, even though the website for peace polls, the official website was used to write these words in Indonesian, it actually says, maybe peace <laughs> will prevail on earth. And I, and I was a little embarrassed when I was speaking to an Indonesian couple about this standing in front of the pole and they were laughing at each other and pointing this out. And, I, and, and then I decided to leave it there because whenever I walk it and whenever any of you walk it, whenever anybody walks it and they hear that story and that reminder that it depends on you, it depends on me, it depends on us, maybe there will be peace. It depends on us. And so let us therefore practice. Practice, practice being peacemakers in the name and in the way of Jesus. Let's make our way to the family table. And as we do so, let's prepare our hearts to receive this feast that has been prepared for us by just remaining seated as we're singing hymn number 510. And let's sing it prayerfully.
please join me in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for the ways that you have shared your dreams of shalom through the authors of Genesis who described Eden, through the prophets who paint the image of a peaceable kingdom, and call upon your children to turn swords into plowshares and no war, no more. Through Jesus, who embodied peace and courageous stillness. And now we come once again to the table you've set for us in our wilderness. A table of identity reminding us who and whose we are. A table of reconciliation where we come together as your forgiven people called to forgive others. A table of nourishment with manna from heaven and fruit of the vine. A table of freedom with places set for every one of us, not because of our worthiness, but because of your grace. A table of love where you gaze upon our hearts with joy and meet you here. And by your spirit, we pray, take this ordinary bread and fruit of the vine and transform it. May it be the body of Christ for the body of Christ. And may the cup of blessing, grace, forgiveness, and new life for each of us and all of us be upon us, we pray. May we be also reminded that here at this table, we are joined by the saints of every time and place, our hearts united in and through Christ. Hear us as we join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Abba, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we come to this family table, whether it's here in a sanctuary or it's in a hospital room, bedside when we're sharing an extension of this table, or it's in someone's living room who is no longer able to leave their home, but we bring the sacrament, we bring the worship experience, we bring the family of faith there. Whenever we come and we remember this meal, uh, we remember that Jesus, as host of the meal, on that night that he was betrayed, took the bread and after giving thanks, broke it and offered it to his friends, his disciples sitting with him and gave it a new meaning and said, this is my body broken and given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. So every time we come to this table, we remember the gifts of God for the people of God until he comes again. And I invite the servers to come forward. We have, uh, our bread is gluten and it will be in the center held by someone in the center. Looks like held by Brian in the center. And on either side, a bowl of the fruit of the vine, a bowl of juice. So you're invited to, I'll come down to you. I'll come down. Okay, you can come up. <laughs> I'll come down to you, Brian. Uh, you're invited to come forward, take a piece of the bread from the center, and then choose a side to go as you return to your seat.
This morning, as I mentioned earlier, we are introducing a new offering. Uh, this is a denominational offering called the, the Peace and Global Witness Offering. You'll hear more about this during the coming weeks. It's introduced today. It will be dedicated on World Communion Sunday, which is the first Sunday of October. Um, and so I won't say a lot about it right now. You'll see um, that uh, in the next slide, um, you'll see that it is an offering that uh, in the next slide, You'll see that it's an offering that 50% of which stays not within our congregation, 25% stays within our congregation, 25% stays within our, um, within our geography, so either with the Presbytery or the Synod, and then 50% goes to, uh, to, to be supportive of peacemakers around the world. And so that offering is an important offering for us to actually give our support our important support to people who are on the ground working in this really risky, sometimes very difficult, painful work of peacemaking. And so it's true, peace begins with each one of us. I also invite you at this time in our offering to give from your heart to the ministries of this church and the work that we do in this community. This comes from a well of gratitude within our hearts and is expressed in our giving. And I thank you again to Doug for a gift of music. I invite the ushers to bring forward the gifts received. We have a prayer shawl we're dedicating this morning also. Thank you. Thank you. We have a prayer shawl we're dedicating this morning. Also, again, as we pray, we are mindful that someone will receive this, and we pray that God's grace will be woven in and through it. God, we give you these gifts that we bring. We ask that you would infuse them with your love and your comfort and your care, uh, your shalom as they go out into the world, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We have one final hymn to sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's stand and sing this one together. You'll find it in the hymn book on uh, number 39. If you want to look in the hymn book, you can follow along on the screen. Great is Thy Faithfulness.
I'll offer a charge and a blessing, and then I'll invite us to sit for the postlude and let that music bless our spirits. And then I'll extinguish the Christ candle and we'll go in peace. Jesus says, peace, I leave you. My peace, I give to you. Take this peace into the world, letting it bless you, letting it challenge you, letting it transform you. Go with God. Amen.